So this is uh, case number one, a 50-year-old man with an ulcerated papule on the nasal ala. So we have uh, two pieces of tissue here. And you can see it's a papule. There's the ulcer with uh, scale crust, bacterial colonies, very common for ulcerated skin lesions. And I think, uh, obviously, I think, uh, how many of you see a lot of skin in your practice uh, every day? So, OK, so only a few. So many of you do more general pathology and just occasionally see skin. So I, I was worried when I, when I submitted the cases. I thought, I don't want them to be too easy and basic, but I also don't want them to be too hard and crazy, esoteric thing that you'll never encounter. So, so I think uh, for dermatopathology, one thing that's important, true for all of pathology, but especially for dermpath, is to start at low power. Because if you go straight into 80, 80 times, 40 times uh, objective, you'll find some atypia or a mitosis, and then you oh, mon dieu, it's malignant, and you will be afraid. Don't be afraid. So look from low power first. And I think um, this part of the lesion here in the center looks very busy, very complex, scary, right? Looks like kind of like cancer to me from low power. But the bottom part of the lesion looks different. And I think that's the key here, is recognizing what's going on at the sides and at the base of the lesion. So let's go look in the middle first. In this area, there are basaloid blue islands of cells, nests, and also these uh, cords or strands that are trickling and, and look infiltrative and invasive into the stroma. Uh, in this area, the cells have a, a more eosinophilic cytoplasm. They have a kind of a keratinized appearance, similar maybe to squamous cell carcinoma. I have seen uh, squamous cell carcinoma look very similar. Uh, probably a closer resemblance is basal cell carcinoma. When basal cell carcinomas are infiltrative or morpheiform, especially when they are ulcerated, they often become very pink and eosinophilic, and they begin to express more keratin, and that gives them a, a keratinized appearance. And the background has a blue myxoid change and reactive spindled fibroblasts, the, the kind of stroma that we often see in basal cell carcinoma. So on a small biopsy of an area like this, it would be very easy. And in fact, I probably would look at that and say, infiltrative carcinoma, basal cell versus squamous cell, I don't know. And sometimes I do that on a small shave biopsy. Are, are shave biopsies common in France? No. I hear no and yes. So I, I one thing, I, I <laughs> this is good, it's c'est bon, c'est bon. Um, one thing I love about uh, teaching different audiences all over the world is I learned that there's such a unique differences in certain areas geographically and different systems of practice. And, and social media, as some of you probably know, I use Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, all of the social media a lot. And it's been great because I get to have conversations about pathology with people from Europe and Africa and the Middle East and Asia, and to see the different kinds of diseases that present in different populations and also to see the different ways biopsies are done, different ways cancer is treated. And it's been a really eye-opening um, experience for me to learn from, from that variation. So in my practice in the United States, shave biopsy is very common. I would say the majority of the skin specimens I see are shave biopsies or sometimes punch biopsy for inflammatory skin disease, rashes. And in fact, you know, the difference in the United States is who is doing the biopsy. If it's a dermatologist, usually shave biopsy is used. For a general surgeon or maybe a family medicine doctor, primary care, they will often do a, an ellipse, an excision, because just because of the differences in training. Shaves are often taught to dermatologists, and excisions are what surgeons do, right? They do excisions. 
And I know that many times my surgery colleagues have said, oh, shave biopsy, no. But even as a very paranoid, myself, paranoid dermatopathologist, if I have to have a lesion biopsied, I'm okay with the shave biopsy as long as it's done by someone with good training and they get deep enough under the lesion. The problem is sometimes shave biopsies are very superficial and very small. And then in those cases, we're often uh, unable to give a precise diagnosis. That is the trade-off. Small biopsy is a smaller scar, but a lower chance of getting a precise diagnosis. So sometimes when I have a small biopsy of an area like this, I would say invasive carcinoma. It could be basal cell. It could be squamous. I'm not sure. Do an excision, and then we will see. But if I said carcinoma here, I would be wrong. This is actually a benign lesion. And the key is not in this area, but in looking at the periphery, the tumor looks very different. It is blue and basaloid. It has some pale, almost clear cytoplasm to the cells. In um, English, at least, and in America, we say clear cell for things that look very different. Clear cell means sometimes totally clear white. Sometimes it just means a little bit pale like gray or a pale eosinophilic. So we use clear to mean a lot of different things. So these cells are maybe not perfectly clear, but they're very pale. And look at the peripheral border, a nice layer of basal palisading, very similar to what you would see in basal cell carcinoma. But look at the stroma. There is not a split, a cleft. Many times basal cell will have that splitting or clefting between the tumor cells and the stroma, and there will be blue myxoid material or mucin. In, um, in, uh, in the United States, there is a difference between, uh, in pathology, pathologists say myxoid for the blue uh, hyaluronic acid. But many dermatology-trained derm paths will say mucin for the same thing, whereas pathologists often use mucin only for you know, epithelial secreted Sciolated mucins. So sometimes I will say mucin, and I, when I mean myxoid, I use those terms kind of interchangeably because I teach both dermatologists and pathologists. So forgive me if I if I speak wrongly. But the uh, this, the lack of clefting here is helpful. The nests push down from the epidermis and have a very smooth border. So the base of the lesion is very smooth overall. A couple of small nests down there, but very smooth. So. At the periphery, we can see this is not an infiltrative tumor. It's a very smooth tumor that bulges down or pushes down from the epidermis into the dermis. It only looks infiltrative in the middle of the lesion, and that is very characteristic of this tumor. So this is a desmoplastic trichelomoma, trichelomoma, whichever name you like. So there's nothing special about this tumor. You can just diagnose this as trichelomoma, period, if you like. The desmoplastic is just a pattern for pathologists to recognize so that you don't mistakenly confuse this with carcinoma. Um, so the, uh, these, uh, it, it, this is a good disease to know about because it may spare someone a larger surgery they don't need. These often occur on the nose or the cheek, on the face, so they may result in Mohs surgery or a larger excision and a scar. Um, if, you, if they were misdiagnosed as carcinoma. The other reason I like to talk about this tumor is the concept here. This concept is useful because multiple different skin adnexal tumors can do this. You tend to see this in trichelomoma very often, but you can see it also sometimes in sweat gland tumors like hydradenoma, where the middle of the lesion, if one of the cysts ruptures, it will look very busy and infiltrative. But if you see low power on a whole excision, you can tell that the periphery is very smooth. So it is kind of a pseudo infiltration, a fake infiltration. It's not really infiltrating, it just looks like it in the middle. So that's the key. And there are times if I have a biopsy, say, of like this, where I just see a tiny bit that looks a little bit like a trichelomoma, then I don't know for sure. I, I think maybe this is desmoplastic trichelomoma, but I'm not sure. So then in my, in my report, I'll say basaloid neoplasm, and that this could be a trichelomoma, a desmoplastic trichelomoma, or maybe a basal or squame. I cannot see enough 
of the lesion, and then they can decide if they want to go and excise more or if they want to wait and watch the patient and see if the lesion recurs or not. So that's how I handle this in practice. If I see uh, enough of this at the edge, then I feel comfortable saying, this is trichelomoma. If it is transected broadly across the bottom of the biopsy, I usually do add a comment that I think this is benign, but if it grows back, then they should excise it or biopsy it again. So that's how I approach these in, in practice. Um, and uh, it is a useful um, tumor to know about because trichelomomas are relatively common skin and nexal tumors. I see them regularly. And of course, patients with multiple trichelomomas may have uh, syndromes like Cowden's, but when solitary, the majority of them that I see are, are incidental, sporadic tumors not associated with any syndrome. So one thing that you can do, immunohistochemistry here, I don't find very helpful, usually with one exception. Sometimes, uh, if the features are not perfect, you can try CD34. CD34 will beautifully stain this basal layer here because this is imitating the outer root sheath of the hair follicle, okay? And the outer root sheath keratinocytes in a hair follicle often have nice, bright, membranous expression of CD34. And so sometimes that can be a helpful feature. Basal cell carcinoma usually will not have CD34 staining, whereas uh, this tumor will. But it only works on the, the outside. The middle of the tumor, I find, does not often stain very well with CD34. I only do this occasionally, not usually. So, so that is uh, something that can be helpful in some cases. Um, what else was I going to tell you about? Oh, uh, okay. So that is a desmoplastic trichelomoma. A couple more things. Uh, number one, these often have a surface that looks like veruca, a wart. This one does not, but this is so perfect otherwise that I chose this case. But many times the surface has papillomatosis, hypergranulosis, parakeratosis, all of the features that you see in veruca. And because of that, some people think that trichelomomas are actually a type of HPV human papillomavirus veruca that's involving a hair follicle. Other people think that they are actually hair follicle tumors. It doesn't matter, right? It's benign either way. So the thing is to recognize it is the most important practically. So there have been papers that have said, oh yes, there's HPV in these. And other papers that say, no, there's no HPV. So I don't know what's really true. There are some pathologists that do not call them trichelomoma, but call them trichelemal veruca. And to me, my understanding is that means the same thing as trichelomoma. So that is always the case in dermatopathology. We can never have just uh, one name. We always must have two, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Many names for each uh, tumor. Are there any questions about trichelomoma? Cowden disease or? I do not routinely write a comment about Cowden uh, disease. And I don't, know, I don't know if that's right or wrong. Um, some things like sebaceous tumors, I usually include a comment about Muratore, for example. But in, uh, for Cowden, I feel like if it's just a single lesion, I don't routinely, but maybe I should. Maybe I should, um, or maybe I would handle it differently if it was a non-dermatologist, uh, like a family practice doctor. Sometimes I will actually include, I use a different type of comment or language in my report, depending on who did the biopsy. A dermatologist I know is familiar with Cowden's uh, disease and other types of syndromes, and so I don't... Um, I don't always tell them as many things. When I'm signing out a case for a general surgeon or a family medicine doctor who may not be as familiar with uh, you know, uncommon skin and nexal tumors, I will often add a comment. This is a benign sweat gland tumor or hair follicle tumor. No further treatment is needed to help them not feel worried about, oh, you know, what do I do now? I need, need to go and Google and find out what this rare tumor is, right? So sometimes I change. What do, what do you do, Arno? Uh, I, I only make the comments for the BAP1. For BAP, okay. 
so there, I'm reading the questions from the from the from the live uh, uh, Chan. So is there anybody that can help? You talked about CD34. Are there any other antibodies, P10 antibody? Or there are other antibodies people have, have talked about. With many of Nexal tumors, people have tried lots of antibodies. I tend to feel that most of the time in skin of Nexal tumors, the H&E morphology and a large enough sample is the critical piece of information. I only use antibodies occasionally. So there are papers about different antibodies, but my personal experience is pretty limited because usually I make the diagnosis predominantly on hematoxylin and ESN morphology. So people ask about BEREP4 activity. Okay, so BEREP4 or BEREP4. My understanding is it should usually stain these tumors and it will stain most hair follicle tumors just like it will stain basal cell carcinoma. Now, there have been some papers talking about differences in pattern of staining, whether it enhances the periphery of the tumor nest or more in the center. But personally, I find those types of you know, very subtle patterns of staining to be challenging and difficult to practically use in my practice because I can make the stain say whatever I, I clicked. No, 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 no. Oh, it's good. I can make the stain say what I want it to say, right? If I want, I can say, oh yeah, it's kind of a little bit strong on the outside. I think it's uh, this, or oh, it's more diffuse. So I find in the end, it's just about as good to me as flipping a coin. So uh, it's kind of like HMB45 for maturation and melanocytic lesions. It, forgive me, Arno. It's very nervous to speak when there's a, a world expert in the audience. Um, so, uh, but, but I feel like it works beautifully on congenital nevi where you don't need it at all. But on difficult problematic lesions, it's more mm, subtle and vague. And then I can say, if I want it to be benign, oh yes, good, good maturation. If I want it to be malignant, I'll say, there's a little staining down deep, I, I'm concerned. So I'm not saying that to be uh, too flippant. Um, but I mean, I do think that practically the immunostains I find most useful are very binary, right? Strong diffuse or anything less than that is negative, strong diffuse is positive. So my favorite immunostains are stains like that. Unfortunately, many immunostains are not that way, right? So I don't know, the, the struggle is real, as we say in English. It's a, it's a struggle every day, no matter how long you do this, it's still hard. I keep telling my fellows and residents, I thought one day dermatopathology would get easy, but that day has not happened yet, so. <laughs> oh, well. Is it good? Yes. Anything else? Okay. Uh, when uh, I tell you the question, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, thank so you very much. The, for the previous two questions, the first one was, are there any antibodies that can help with the differential diagnosis of desmoplastic trichelomoma versus a basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And the second question was, what is the utility of BER-EP4 or BER-EP4 um, in this differential? And then uh, Dr. De La Fuchaudier, forgive me for the yeah. pronunciation, uh, is, um, uh, asked the question about whether or not I include a comment about Cowden's disease uh, whenever I routinely sign these out. And the answer for me is that I do not, but I think that um, there could be multiple different ways to handle that. Okay.